I was going to start, actually, by dedicating the talk to Dave Hickey. Uh, a lot of what I wanted to say has been said, and I'll just point out, of course, that indeed this is really one of the great, great places of Dave's life. That Beaumont show, I wasn't able to see it, but I kept hearing about it, and I was able to see pictures of it. And, and uh, so you have a special place toward a redeemed cosmopolitanism, Beaumont, beautiful world. Beautiful, of course, being a big word for him. Beauty. Eric Guitar. I mean, apart from whatever, what everybody else said, he's one of the heroes, and he's one of my heroes. As I was getting started in Los Angeles in the 70s, he had a column going in Art Issues. As parenthetically at the same time did Rebecca Solnit. Um, and uh, basically he was one of my masters. You know, we occasionally met and so forth and were able to ooh and out each other, but, but, uh, but he was a teacher. And apart from everything else that was mentioned, he's a great, great writer. Um, you know, I, 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 I'd written down some, some adjectives. Um, irascible, <laughs> pugnacious, the knight errant of beauty, uh, wry, funny, generous, and then sweet and mild as well as everything else. And I just want to say that he's one of the great writers, not critics, one of the great writers of our generation. So um, he's gone, but then not. Uh, he's certainly not forgotten. In fact, he's unforgettable. So I'll just move on. Uh, and indeed, uh, John, I had, I had promised to do a talk on the light of Los Angeles. But I've been here for four or five days, and it's kind of changed. I mean, I, I was going to begin by um, talking about why the light of Los Angeles is so Actually, the physical, topographical reasons are so strange and so wonderful. Um, and I was going to talk about the fact that if you are in the northern hemisphere, and you have a desert that abuts the sea, and then on top of that, you have a plate tectonic dramatic situation that raises mountains uh, on the edge there of the desert. Uh, there. Um, by the way, should we turn off the lights? Is, is, would that be better? Um, just leave the light on for me. But, uh, uh, but um, here we go. Um, that ridge there of the San Gabriel Mountains, this will amaze you, is the fastest rise from basin to peak anywhere in the world. In like a mile, it raises, it goes 10,000 feet or something. Couch, by the way, right there in the corner is Pasadena, Altadena, the home, birth home of, uh, and the heart's true home of, of Helen. And I was going to give this whole talk. I was going to talk about the, one of the things about the light of L.A. And anybody who flies into L.A. from New York or from, from probably from here, you notice when you get just below the mountains, everything goes still. There's a strange stillness, independent of the Santa Ana Santa Ana and so forth. Um, but so there you are flying in. This is actually backwards, but you're coming from the far side, yeah. And that stillness of the air, light is caused by the mountains that are bracketing. And it's the reason that you have so many important observatories. The stars don't twinkle in Los Angeles. Um, you get, and that's bad. when stars twinkle, that's bad for astronomers. And when you get a, you know, pinprick stars, uh, that was good. And that is why the majority, probably, of the great uh, discoveries in astronomy in the first half of the 20th century were at Mount Wilson, Mount Palomar. And I was going to talk about the way that there's different 
kinds of light. When people talk about LA light, there's golden light. Um, I was going to talk about, um, I did a piece about the light of Los Angeles for the New Yorker. And uh, during that time, I had occasion uh, to talk a lot about smog and had a wonderful time talking to Glenn Cass at Caltech, who was a uh, chemical uh, geophysicist specializing in air. And what he fascinated him about the air of LA was that he could be on the roof at Caltech a mile away from the mountains and not see them. And then he gave me this incredible description of why that was the case. Because it turns out that there's particles in the air are of different sizes. There are big ones, and then there's medium ones, and there's small ones. And the big ones and the small ones are not the issue, it's the medium ones. Because they, and they come from methane and they come from cars. And so cows and cars are the basic. <laughs> Time out, funny story. Um, Derrida, the great French critic and, and literary critic, was giving a lecture, his first lecture in the United States. And the whole throng was there to hear him. And he kept on talking about cows. And he said, he said, you know, the phenomenology of cows and the significance of cows. And everybody was taking notes and they didn't know it. And then there was a break and he came back up and he said, excuse me, I'm told it's pronounced chaos. <laughs> but in this instance, I'm talking about cows, cows and cars. And the point is that those particular particles are exactly the diameter, the, the width of light waves. And so it happens that if you are on the roof of Caltech looking toward the mountains, if the, mount, if the sun is behind you, it is as if a billion suns are in your eye. It just bounces off. I have a pen, poet friend who was particular and said, no, no, it's a billion moons, but okay. Um, but the point is that I was taking notes furiously, and he said, we uh, scientists you know, have words for everything. And uh, we have a word for this, and I got out my notepad, I'm getting ready to write down a technical word. And he said, the technical word is air light. Air light, being lost in the air light. Anyway, I was going to talk about that, and I was going to talk about all the people I talked to. Coy Howard talked about the threeness of light in L.A. And what he meant was, he said, if you go on the beach and you see birds, you see the object, you see the shadow, and you see the reflection. Um, I talked to a lot of screenwriters, I talked to a lot of artists. Um, I talked to John Bailey, who said uh, that there's a joke among cinematographers that... Um, uh, that when the two of them are standing on the Palisade in Santa Monica watching the sunset, and just as it slips into the water, everything is like this, you know, this is fantastic old time hour. One says to the other, it's incredible the effects that guy gets with just one unit. <laughs> anyway, I, I had a whole lecture laid out. But I've been here for four or five days, and... and uh, I want to talk about Helen, so I'm going to shift over to that. I will say that if you want to read the piece I wrote about the light of L.A., uh, it's on my website, which is www.lawrencewasher.com. I have it under the name The Light of L.A. It's also collected in my book, Vermeer in Bosnia. Vermeer because everything is Vermeer. And, uh, anyway, so you can find it uh, easily. But I'm reminded of, uh, when I think about talking to you about the light of L.A., I'm reminded of something my colleague at the New Yorker, Ian Frazier, once wrote in one of the great, great, great pieces from the old style New Yorker about Heloise, the person who did the, ho the housekeeping events. And he was were living up in, um, in Missoula, Montana at the time, and he had to drive down to San Antonio, Texas. And somewhere around five pages, five columns into his piece, He's driving down, he enters Texas, and he keeps driving. And he has a sentence where, he, where he's coming, and he says, I was having all these fantastic thoughts about how Texas is different from every other place in the country. And I was going to put them down right here, right now. 
And then I thought, nah. I feel the same way about the light of Los Angeles today. Let's get serious. So I've changed my mind. I'm going to do a talk about Helen. And um, in particular, I'm just going to take some overpasses from different directions uh, of things that I've been thinking about uh, through, the, through the graciousness and the grace of her contribution. Um, Helen, there she is. Um, and we well, you know, I'm not going to describe her in adjectives because you're going to see her up here in a few minutes, and you've also got a sense of having seen her work. But it's been a great delight in my life in the last couple of years to be getting to know her better. Can you hear me okay? Um, but Helen, one of the things that's interesting about Helen is that unlike almost all the other artists in the light and space movement, she came out of, art, out of art history. She was an academic. Growing up in, in uh, Pasadena, she eventually goes to, to Pomona College, where she had an extraordinary experience with some great, great uh, art historians. Um, she then went on to do work, to, to, to go went to the East Coast, to Bo Columbia and to Boston. Um, and uh, she specialized in the light, besotted artists of the Dutch Golden Age. And among others, Vermeer. By the way, look at, aren't these kind of similar pictures? The way that, that she's asleep and the world of her dreams is over there on that side. It's almost like a circle. So, and the reason I think it's important to talk about Vermeer when one's talking about her is that, to my mind, the key thing that Vermeer is about is slow looking, slow being, is about duration. There's a thing you think about with Vermeer, especially with the pictures of women, and you're not really aware that this is what you're thinking of. But time and again, or oh, I should start by saying that the subtitle of this show is Presences. And you kind of think, if you're thinking about a painter or an artist, that presence might mean present tense, being right now, you know, present, present tense. And that's the opposite of what presence means. Presence is about duration. It's not about split second. It's about being present before something across time. And in fact, I, I want to suggest that in Helen's work, her great passion, light, is synonymous with time. And that's part of what you find when you go out there that you have to stop and look. And in the case of Vermeer, time and again, he has paintings of women who are having to sit still or stand still for some reason. For some reason. In this case, the lace maker who is having to put all of her concentration onto a sliver of space over time. By the way, the thing that's interesting, maybe you can see it. Um, excuse me. I'm talking about this. One of the things people often talk about with Vermeer is that, well, he was able to do it because he was using a camera obscura, you know, easy. We could all do it. Um, the thing that was fascinating for the first time, other artists were using various sorts of perspective tools, but what he was fascinated about with the camera obscura was everything being out of focus except the thing that was in focus. Again, think about Helen in this context. Um, and in this case, everything in the, and so what he got out of the camera obscura was not to get things in focus, but to be able to capture things that were out of focus. And think about it, it's very hard to capture things that are out of focus because the minute you look at them, they're in focus. But if you have a projection of a camera obscura, the threads are out of focus. And you'll see this all the time with his stuff. And in this painting, there's only one thing that is in focus, the subject of all of her concentration, and that is the thin V of threads. And if you look at her hands, 
and the V and the M of her hands. She's looking at Vermeer. So that he's looking at her, she's looking at him. There's this kind of godlike dynamic in many ways. Uh, anyway, I could talk more about that, but I'll save that for some other time. But again, look at this. In this case, and this again brings out the point I'm making about time. Look, there's a sense in which what's happening is that the, uh, you have turned your attention to a woman who doesn't realize that she's being looked at. And you are startled, you, are, you stand stark still, looking at this thing of the person frozen in action. In this case, she's balancing scales. But if you look there, what she's really doing is balancing light. There's all kinds of things going on in this painting. And behind her is the Last Judgment, talk about the balancing of scales. She's pregnant. I mean, there's so many things going on. But the thing that you turn and you end, this is the reason that it seems to me that a lot of his work has the feeling of a memory of something you saw, and you saw across a stretch of time, and it just kind of burned itself into your consciousness. This one here. A woman happens to be holding up a necklace in the mirror, but the real drama here, the subject of this painting, is the light. And the light crossing the room like a tide. So the same amount of time you have her holding on like that, there's this kind of quality of light being in the center of the piece and the passage of time in light. I put this one up here because this is one of the great, great, great Vermeers. It's the dress in Vermeer earlier this year and what I take to be the, the story of the year culturally. It was destroyed by conservators. I'm not going to talk about why. You can go look it up yourself. I'm not going to try to um, honor them with even mentioning what they did, but it's too bad. But it's a great painting. And if one, when it comes to Helen, a thought I have about this, here again you have the milkmaid pouring milk. But the passage of time, can you believe how the milk is pouring there? You can see it pouring. How did he do that? I mean, you see it actually coming out. And I say, it occurs to me that this is having witnessed it. This is what Helen does with, with her concave, very, very mildly concave. She has some of those, those the spheres, uh, excuse me, the lenses, and it's sequential pourings so that... Uh, one after another, eight, sometimes 15, 18, very thin pores. Finally, of course, this, paint, this painting. Um, the interesting thing about this painting, I want to suggest that Vermeer invented cinema. It's not just that he was using a camera but that he had found ways to have duration in a picture. And in this particular painting, um, the girl with the pearl, who, by the way, is obviously not his mistress and is obviously not the housekeeper. Any father of a daughter knows that's his daughter. That is the look that a father gets when the daughter says, Daddy, <laughs> are we finished? Um, <laughs> But more in this case, what's fascinating, and here I'm indebted to Edward Snow, the other great critic. Um, if you put your thumb in front of the face, if that's, uh, let's see. if that's too big to do it on, you can do it on this one here. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you, you should always carry your Vermeer with you, however you go. Anyway. Um, <laughs> If you put your thumb in front of the face, everything else in the picture would suggest that that's going to be a Florentine profile. You would expect the face to be facing, you know, just like that. Uh, but it is torqued towards you when you take your thumb away. If you take a look at the top of the turban, everything up there is suggesting that the tail of the turban would fall behind her far, her far shoulder as she's moved her head. 
but it's a torque going exactly the opposite way. Edward Snow says that the question to ask of this picture is, has she just turned towards you, or is she just about to turn away? Or has she just turned away? And he says the answer is, she was looking away, she torn, turned towards you and is about to look away again. And he captures just that moment and the melancholy of that moment for a father. The tear gets translated to the pearl. Here. But the point is, it's a movie. It has that kind of duration. The great, great, great interpretation of this painting in the 20th century is Chris Marker's film La Jete, um, which if you've never seen it, you should go see it. It's on YouTube. It's a 40-minute film, early new wave, French new wave. And it is made entirely, it's, a, it's by the way the first, it's the definitive time travel movie, as you'll see. But one of the things that's going on is that it's all done in single shot photographs, beautiful photographs. But just they, they kind of come up, they go down, they come up, they go down, they come up, they go down. And it's a, a love story lost in time. But at one point, the woman, the pictures are of the woman sleeping. The man who's come from the future is in love with her. He's watching her. And there's this moment, this rhythm, where suddenly there's a little piece of action footage, which consists of her looking up, opening her eyes, blinking, and closing them, and then the picture goes back to being that rhythm. So it's closed, open, closed, rhythm, rhythm, rhythm. And that is, uh, that's Vermeer in cinema today, basically. But I mention all this, because it seems to me that, that a, an academic, um, an art historian, a lover of Vermeer, uh, a lot of that gets translated into some of these lenses. And particularly when the lenses are on their five minute rising and subsiding, um, that is coming out of, that is about time and light being the same thing, and both of them only existing in duration. So that's one. Then there's this, this guy. Um, this is a book that everybody should have. It's by 1950 by a philologist. It's hard to know. In the old days, everybody knew what philologists were, but he was a philologist at Cambridge, R.B. O'Neill's. And he wrote a book with the most wonderful title called The Origins of European Thought About the Body, the Mind, the Soul, the World, Time, and Fate. <laughs> and uh, this is an incredible book, because this guy, one of the things that you have to be, if you're a philologist, is extremely erudite. You have to know all the languages, all the ancient languages, you know, Sanskrit, so forth. This guy knows everything. And what he's trying to do is to figure out from language, for example, what pre, uh, you know, pre-Socratic, pre-Hippocratic Greek thought how they thought the, the, the body worked. Some of you who've read my book on Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonder about the Museum of Jurassic Technology, uh, for long reasons I won't go into, I end up in the last footnote is kind of an embolism. And it's all drawing on, on Onions. So for example, Onions is able to show from language from early language, that it's clearly the case that, that ancient Greeks, but also Sanskrit, Mesopotamia, believed that the fluid around the brain was the same as spinal fluid and was the same as semen. And you see this when you see like words like serial, cerebellum, genes, genius, genius. In other words, he had developed an entire theory of the horny, you know, long before Freud, and Freud is just basically unpacking all that stuff. He has amazing stuff about Acteon, the guy who saw uh, uh, Diana naked, or, um, and um, Artemis, as she was called by the Greeks. And then she throws 
water in his eyes, and he grows antlers for having seen Diana naked. Uh, and, by the way, antler in German is Alban sprouts, eye sprouts. In French, it's Antea, in the place of eyes. As you know, he, he grows antlers, and he was a hunter, and he accidentally saw Diana naked, and then he, she turns him into a stag, and he is pursued by his hounds to his death. Another time out. Uh, in early English, the Ovid that Chaucer was using was translated by John Gower. And he uh, has a trans uh, phrase about the, the sadness, the tragedy of Acteon's fate. And he has this exceptional triple pun. It was an exemplum, it was an exemplum, exemplum of Miss Luck, by which Acteon had the bad luck to miss Luck at Lady Luck. Anyway, but that's the kind of thing you find in annoyance. But that's not what I want to talk about him right now. What I want to talk about him right now is he is able to show, and this is just mind blowing. That in pre-Hellenic, pre-Socratic, but certainly Homeric uh, language, it is clear that the uh, the ancients, and this so shows up in, in as he puts it, Hindu H I N D O O is how it was spelled then, Hindu uh, ancient Hindu writing and so forth, that the locus of seeing, of looking of mind to a large degree, of, of hearing, was not in the brain, it was in the lungs. And, for example, the word psyche, that, that sense of mind, soul, and so forth, psyche comes from the word for breathing, which you could say it's because of life force. But what he shows is that what they believed is that it was nested in the lungs, and that all of those senses were like breathing. You breathe in, you breathe out. The world came through your pupils, and your attention went out of your pupils. And this was a continual breathing in and breathing out. In Homer, there are several passages where a character breathes at somebody, which means they look at them. And it's reciprocal because when somebody breathes at some, at the, when the other person who's being looked at breathes, they are looking back. This, by the way, when it gets to Latin, becomes spirit, which is a cognate of respiration, inspiration, all those worlds. And it makes you realize that when you see archaic torsos, for example, this is not a chopped up piece of a body. This is the location of mind, of spirit. So this is, the reason they get rid of all the other stuff is to let you look, this is absolutely the soul of somebody. The quintessence of somebody is this part of the body. In both female and male uh, torsos. Which, uh, let me find here, I need something. Brings us to the great, great, writer on this subject, which is, of course, um, Rilke, who has a poem called Archaic Torso of Apollo. Um, there are all kinds of translations, and I'm relying mainly on Edward Snow's translation, but I have a few things that I've altered based on other translations. So looking at that, Rilke says, we never knew his head and all the light that ripened in his fab fabled eyes. But his torso still gleams like a dimmed candelabrum in which his gaze, lit long ago, holds, holds fast and shines. Otherwise, the surge of the breast would not blind you nor a smile run through the slight twist of the loins toward the center where procreation flared. He's describing the torso as a face. Look, looking 
looking at you. Otherwise, this stone would stand deformed and curt on the, the shoulders transparent plunge and not glisten like the fur of wild beasts, nor burst forth from all its contours like a star. For there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. Coming back to these lenses of Helen's, I think obviously the, the brightening and the dimming and so forth, and for that matter, the same with, with the LACMA columns, uh, is all about breathing in, breathing out. Uh, something you feel when you're in, in the presence of these is that they are breathtaking. You may have the experience that I have where a pillow of air gets stuck in your mouth and you forget to breathe <laughs> for like 10 seconds. You know. But it's also, there's all kinds of people, things of what people say. It reminds them of cloud banks, of bruises, of smudges, that it's kind of there, it's kind of not there. That's part of the Vermeer, in focus, out of focus. You know, and how do you, one of the things that Helen has figured out a way to do is to portray things that cannot be brought into focus. Which, as I've said, is very difficult to do. Because whenever you look at it, you get into focus. But it's even more the case here that once in a while you'll have it, and what it will look like is an eye staring back at you. You'll notice at certain points when it begins to darken and so forth. And it's really an eye thou experience, it becomes existential. Uh, there's no place that does not see you. You must change your life. That is absolutely one of the things that's going on with those pictures. Okay. Third of my little overflights. Um, I'll begin with the book of Genesis, the first lines. Now, this is the Revised Standard Version. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. The actual word that's being used there in the Latin version is spiritus, and, and it is translated variously as the Spirit of God, and it moved over the waters, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, but here, spirit is breath. This is this is at the very beginning when all was, was formless. The breath, the wind of God, was over the waters. Now you all remember the third um, uh, stanza. And then there was, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, what's interesting in different traditions is that um, God, when God says, let there be light, is when things really get going. And in the Kabbalistic tradition, uh, things go wrong, and things get shattered and so forth, and, and the fall is that little droplets of light. Originally, he puts them into, in the, in the Kabbalistic tradition, he puts all the force into these uh, glass vessels, there's ten glass vessels, and it's too much and it shatters. And all these droplets of light fall into the world. And uh, for that reason, God can't do it by himself anymore. He himself is wounded. And the droplets are the souls of people. They're inside people. And it has to be worked with people. But no matter what, you get the notion when God creates man in his own image, there is the sense of little droplets of light are in each of us that are the transcendent things. I want to talk about these three characters in this context. Um, and um, let me see if I can find this. Um, five points for anybody who identifies the upper one in that corner. Uh, Montaigne, anybody? It's Descartes. Five points for anybody who recognizes him. Camus, very good. Um, a thousand points for anybody who recognizes the middle one. 
and is an extraordinary, extraordinary philosopher in the first half of the 20th century named Shestov, Lev Shestov. I want to start with Descartes, go to Shestov, and then go to Camus. Descartes, of course, has that moment of great doubt, where he doubts everything, he doubts everything, he's trying to get to what the fundament of something he can know for certain. Um, and he gets to the point where he's doubting everything, but then he realizes somebody is doubting. You know, uh, he makes, I think, an illegitimate leap uh, from cogito, from thinking that there's somebody here thinking, to uh, from from uh, cogito to the being. There must be somebody thinking. It must be me. I think that's a little bit of a leap. I think all you can really say is somebody, some thinking is going on. Therefore, thinking is going on. But let's assume. Let's follow with him. And then he begins to build up from the fact that he is there. And he's trying to grapple and to work his way up. And he wants to do it by pure logic. And the key thing in the meditation is this paragraph. But he wants to do it by intuition. By intuition, I mean a conception formed by unclouded mental attention, so clear and so distinct as to leave no doubt as the thing we are understanding. It is an indubitable conception formed by an unclouded and attentive mind, one that originates solely from the light of reason. And from that he eventually is able to convince himself that God must exist because he has light. Somebody must have given him light. That must be light. And he builds up from there. <coughs> Shestov was a very, very extraordinary. His great book is called Athens and Jerusalem. It's really worth looking at. And he basically was a profound irrationalist. Understandably so. If you look at 20th century history. Um, and he says at one point in Athens and Jerusalem, which he sees as the two opposing forces. But even Socrates asked his daemon to protect him from clarity and distinctness. There are truths that do not want to wish do not wish to be truths for all, and they are drawn from a source which no one would call luminous, not even by way of metaphor. Husserl was a great, great fan of Shestov's, um, even though he was a fan of Descartes also. And somebody else who talks about Shestov a lot is Camus. And Camus kind of does a dialectical combining of the two. This is Camus in the Sisyphus. Prayer, prayer, says Alain, is when night descends over thought. But the mind must meet the night, reply the mystics and the existentialists. Yes, indeed, but not that night born under closed eyelids and through the mere will of man, dark impenetrable night, impenetrable night, that the mind rails up in order to plunge into it. If it must encounter a night, let it be that of a despair which remains Lucid. Lucid is the big word in, in Camus. Lucidity, as opposed to light. Polar night. Vigil of the mind. Whence arise, perhaps, that white and virginal brightness which outlines every object in the light of the intelligence. At that degree, and here I want to suggest this is Pashkin, at that degree, Equivalence encounters passionate understanding. I think I have a right to, Helen, and Michael, you can ask her whether I'm right about this, but I do know that Camus is one of her favorite writers, that she uh, reads The Fall once a year, she tells me. Um, and, the, and I think that a lot of what's going on in this work, if you were to give it words, is equivalence encountering passionate understanding, an evenness that encounter is 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 deeply lucid, but it isn't simple. You know, it's not, not just you know, easy light. It's 
is deeply, deeply, and it's also part of why it's important for this to be in the dark, and so forth. Okay, last of my flyovers. Rembrandt, again, we're dealing here with an art historian. This is Rembrandt in 1652, the year he made this extraordinary etching, which is generally called the scholar in his study. Helen did her, I believe it's her master's thesis, in any case, spent a year in, in at Boston College working on the iconography of this picture. It's an extremely mysterious picture. What's going on? She is fairly convinced, <clears throat> for example, by doing research that proved that Rembrandt would have had occasion to see Faust, Marlowe's Dr. Faustus she was able to find evidence that Dr. Faustus was translated, was going all over Holland, among other places, and that people would have known about Faustus. And she makes a very strong case that, that this is Faust. It happens as a continuing controversy, but it so impressed uh, Jacob Rosenberg, is that correct? Yeah. Who was the head of the fog at, at, um, at uh, Harvard. And he said... You know, there are thousands of people applying for these slots, but we only take two, and you have to come here to work on your PhD based on this kind of thing. What's funny about this piece, if you look at it, I mean, you can spend a lot of time thinking about who that guy is, but what's amazing is that. And I think it's not a, 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 an accident uh, that Helen ends up creating work that looks like that. And in fact, the other day when we had a photographer here uh, taking pictures of the show and Helen and so forth, uh, we set that up. Um, I would say, uh, time out. Um, my grandfather was a composer. Hans talk. Uh, part of the German emigre community in Los Angeles and Santa Monica, and was friends with all, with Schoenberg and Thomas Mann and all kinds of people. Uh, Thomas Mann, as you may know, in 1948 publishes Dr. Faustus. Um, and Adorno spends a lot of time tutoring Thomas Mann in Schoenberg's 12-point technique. And the composer who is the character, the main character of Dr. Faustus, which in some level is kind of an allegorical treatment of the history of Germany, of German intellectual life, right after the Second World War. Um, and this composer in the novel is incredibly on fire, his mind is on fire, and he, in effect, makes a deal with the devil, and it is struck in the form of his one time in his life having sex with a prostitute and contracting syphilis. And, uh, and it's thought, and, and, and so uh, Schirmer gets very upset about this. And Alma Mahler, who you know, was the, the widow of Mahler and Gropius and, Ver, and Verifel and so forth, and was a busybody, would go to Schirmer and say, do, do you see, what, to Thomas Mann, to Schirmer and say, do you see what Thomas Mann is doing? And Schirmer got more and more upset, and, and so forth and so on. Um, and anyway, it happens that uh, he sent a copy of, well, there's two stories here. First of all, there's a great story that I was told by Marta Feuchfanger, one of the emigres, years later, and she said that one day she was at the Brentwood Mart, the, the kind of uh, grocery mart in, in West LA, and she was reaching for a grapefruit, and in the distance, Schoenberg was yelling at her in German, it's not true, Frau Marta, it's not true, I never had syphilis a day in my life. <laughs> and the idea of this grapefruit and this kind of grapefruit head of Schoenberg's is fine. <laughs> but the other thing is that in the midst of all this, uh, he, Thomas Mann sent a copy of Dr. Faust's to my grandfather with the inscription, Ferenc Tach, who would never need the devil. Snap. Anyway, um, 
notwithstanding the connection I'm making between Faust and your work on Faust, I'm not in any way suggesting that uh, that Helen would ever need the devil of anything. She's celestial. And I'll close on this one, which is just a... By the way, this is uh, one of the pictures from the, from the Radius book. Incredibly difficult to capture this kind of effect. Uh, but there it is. And this is Helen at her most celestial. Uh, and when you, get, when you take a look at the book, you'll see that the very last photograph in the book, and I'm going to stop with this, is a picture of Helen taken last year body surfing. And look at the color. Where does she get those colors? Which brings us back to the light of LA. Thank you.